Welcome to the fourth video on harmonic distortion. Today I'm going to talk about the terms linear and ultralinear, and I'm going to touch on tubes versus transistors. I want to separate fact from fiction for marketing. I want you to understand what these terms mean. As a reference point, these are my references. I'm going to speak to you on this entire series from this body of work. These are the authors the PhDs, the engineers that took electrical concepts and created vacuum tubes and advanced vacuum tube technology and it stopped at this point in time. There's nothing new about a, a current vacuum tubes. Everything we know about today's vacuum tubes are found in this body of work. Uh, Spragenberg he went into a lot of details about the grid, grid type wires, how they're constructed, spacing, all that stuff, because from that we know what the grid curves will look like and how to design, it, whether it's a beam pentode or just a pentode or a triode. From his work we get that. Nothing else has been new today, done and new today. Everything we know about vacuum tubes is right here. So when I talk about linear and ultralinear, it's a marketing term for stereos and guitar amps. As a ham radio operator, it's a mute point. Of course, the amplifier is going to be linear. No, I'm sorry. It's going to be ultra linear. No, I got that wrong too. For the FCC to allow me to transmit a thousand to two thousand watts, my amplifier better be a little bit beyond ultra linear. I cannot have harmonics, period. End of story, or they will send you uh, a note saying you've got to clean it up. So these terms are really a more marketing for stereo and guitar amps, not for ham radio operators. So I'm not going to really get into the ham radio operation, although the uh, what I'm going to talk about today is very applicable, but I, most of what you're all building uh, come from a uh, pentode such as this driven by a one watt uh, tube. Uh, but this will run at about uh, 150, 160 volts on the plate. This will need about 400 volts on the plate. Maybe you're using a uh, triode. Again, 400 volts on the plate. Needs a one watt driver. Most people look at this and go, then they also want to know something about cathode stripping. It, it's kind of a yawn fest for me. Uh, it, it's fun to talk about. It, it does occur, I guess, but this doesn't bother me. So most of you are building with this. So you have a 10 watt, 15 watt, 30 watt, 60 watt, 120 watts, up to 200 watts, depending on how many of these power tubes you have in their configuration. So I'm going to limit the discussion about linear and ultralinear to this. Um, I'm not going to talk about this particular tube. This is a tetrode. It is capable of 60 watts right off the bat. I also need to put a fan cooling and duct pipe on it to keep it running uh, without overheating, but this is 60 watts. This needs 3000 volts DC on the plate. You all are building uh, these with 400 volts on the plate. Yeah, they're about the same size, but the power supply on this is a challenge all to itself, let alone this one. This one's easy peasy. You know, I get a rectifier, get it out there, a couple caps, I'm done. This one's a whole different matter. A lot more uh, cleaning up has to happen to rectify the voltage. Oh, doesn't end there. This is what I call a pentode. So by comparison, you all are building with these. This is a, it's going to operate in beyond ultralinear operation. This is good for 400 watts single-ended amplification transmit. Or a pair of them, you can go up to a thousand watts to transmit. The power supply on this is very healthy. I need 3000 volts on the DC plate to make this operate 
and it has to operate much cleaner than this particular tube in ultra linear operation. So I'm not going to talk about this bad boy. I'm just going to limit it to the rest of you all who are using these in your stereo amplifiers and guitar amps. Oh, for both this one and the other one, you need a 5 watt driver, which means I'm going to need a Pento to drive it probably. Yeah, and that needs cleaned up too. So the challenges for this is going to be limited to stereos and guitar amps. You're probably building uh, 200 watts of on a stereo amp is getting kind of uncommon. Although I've seen someone build a stereo amp with a pair of these. <laughs> yeah, we all want one of those. But we're going to limit it to little stuff. So, first myth. Vacuum tube amplifiers have even harmonics, whereas transistor uh, amplifiers have odd harmonics. From the last video, uh, we've dispelled that one. I, I've shown you the uh, the harmonic power curves for both a triode and a, t a pentode and they both have second and third order harmonics. They occur differently depending on the load for each but a tube and a transistor both exhibit uh, even and odd harmonics. The key gets down to how are you operate in order to mitigate those harmonics single-ended or push-pull. For a single-ended uh, tube amp without a mitigating feedback they have an abundance of even harmonics and they also produce odd harmonics as well. I've already shown that. And a lot of it gets down to where that load line is crossing through the grid lines on the average plate characteristics curve. That is what we need to study and calculate the harmonics. Push-pull circuits. The whole idea of a push-pull circuit is that with the tubes both being balanced, amplifying the same amount and they have the same gain, the second order harmonic, the even order harmonics are going to be naturally uh, canceled out. The third harmonic, especially with a pentode, will pass through. And the more you amplify a third harmonic, the worse it sounds. So with the push-pull, no evens lots of odds. With a push-pull amplifier, typically in stereo amps, we will have a negative feedback circuit in those in order to get rid of the third harmonic. That will be part of the topography, so you should be looking for that. So the fundamental goes through, you have an A wave and a B wave, and when they come out of both stages, you put them into the output transformer, and the output transformer then combines them into a larger wave. Now then, the second harmonic coming through, uh, say, the A tube, and the second harmonic coming through the B tube are both full wave, up and down. The A wave is only a positive going, the B wave is only a negative going wave. They combine to make a big one, but and they're out of phase 180 degrees, but the second order, or even order harmonics, when they go through the tube, you have a full wave, and each tube is 180 degrees out of phase, and the second and even order harmonics go away. So now we have to worry about cleaning up the third order harmonic in order to get this to sound more linear or ultra linear, but we'll have to put in a negative feedback circuit. This is a, a, a chart that shows you how acoustics occur with a sound pressure level, which is the vertical axis versus frequency. So when we get into rules of thumbs, you know, when does a second or a third order harmonic sound bad? When do we need to take care of it? Uh, I want to first show you this, that at about 80, uh, 90 uh, dB, this curve, the average curve, which is this dotted line, I'll highlight it for red, in red for you, it's basically flat, if you will, through most of the useful range of the frequency spectrum, from about 100 hertz up to maybe 2500 hertz, relatively speaking, is pretty flat. Now, when you get over 110 dB, these, uh, 
these frequencies f uh, all follow this curve here and this is the threshold of feeling which is also the threshold of pain at this point this frequency when it gets above this say 32 Hertz gets above 120 uh, DB it's going you're going to start feeling it and can start hurting uh, 500 Hertz above 150 DB is going to cause pain if you start operating up in this range here you're going to have ear damage and quite frankly this is another curve right here this upper threshold generally above that which is right around 100 db for any period of time you're going to suffer hearing loss this lower line but at that line and below the frequency is going to be a little harder to hear but that's just kind of a threshold of most people should hear the frequency at this level. Here are your constants. I've talked about overtones, the sibilance, the S sounds are up here, constants are down here. This area in the middle is pretty much where most instruments play from 100 to 2000 Hertz, somewhere in there. And most amplifiers are uh, amplifying the stereo amps and guitar amps. They're this is the fundamental frequencies they're amplifying is in this mid-range and that's where the vacuum tubes are designed to minimize as many harmonics as possible the second and third so then there's these rules of thumb out there at 8000 Hertz which is right here so just above overtones at that point and above uh, for a single in a tube amp uh, you'll start hearing a harmonic when it reaches about 5% or, or on a push-pull 3%. For a single in a tube amp, that means the second harmonic is going to be heard. For a push-pull, it means a third harmonic is going to be heard. And it may start, uh, especially with a third harmonic, it may start sounding unpleasant. At 5,000 hertz and below, which is from about here down, which is most of the other useful range, which is pretty much the center uh, mid-range frequency for the de uh, vacuum tube design. We designed them down in this this area here. Then the rules of thumb are that for a second single end of tube amp, above 12%, most everybody should hear that harmonic. The second harmonic will be well heard. But truthfully, above 5%, you start hearing them. But if you're, if you're losing your hearing, then it starts pushing up around 9-10%. So somewhere above 12%, it becomes undesirable. Under 12%, it may be a good thing. My Premier Twin 8 operates at 9%. It's a good thing. But if I were to push it to 12, it'd probably go from good to bad, and you wouldn't like it. A push-pull, 10%, mostly because of the third-order harmonic. So when we talk about linear amplification, what that generally means, when you're looking at the schematic, what you're looking for is it's probably a true triode. You're probably looking at a triode power tube. But these things don't give you a lot of power. And, and when you start loading up, the power drops off quickly. Where on a pentode, as I've shown before, it's kind of plateaus out. And I get power out of here, but it comes at a cost of the third harmonic. It could be that the pentode or tetrode is being operated in triode mode. So it's not as perfect as a triode, but it's a good next bet, and I'll cover that later. It's being also operated at the second harmonic point, where it's the lowest. Remember the V in the last video? We're trying to get close to that and span the gap. It's not right at that lowest point, but it may be somewhere off, and we're trying to, you know, best fit an amplifier to do as most the most good we can with as widest uh, frequency spectrum we can to keep most of the harmonics at bay without costing a lot. So this amplifier is not going to cost near like an ultra linear amplifier. Simpler design, and the negative feedback is a resistor on the res on the speaker that goes to a preamp somewhere before it injects it to the grid of the power tube. Very simple. Uh, negative feedback design. Ultra linear. So you need all that and 
which you also need. Did I cover a third point here? Yeah, a beam, if it's single-ended tube amp, generally a beam pentode is going to be used. So we take all this and we add to it the following. We add. So pentodes and tetrodes are probably going to be used in AB operation. Why? Boom. Second order harmonics, gone. Third order, we're going to take care of that. It doesn't mean no distortion. Everyone automatically goes, there's no distortion. Well, we have to fight distortion. We still have to fight that battle. But it's now narrowed down to the third order harmonic. Remember, all the other odd harmonics don't have enough amplitude or power to actually cause us a problem in the audio frequency range. So we have to focus on that third harmonic. We've got to clean that up. They're probably configured in common cathode amplification. That's fairly common. Uh, it also means uh, the distortion's less. So back on linear amplification, we can tolerate up to about 5% in harmonics. That's what they're going to be built for. The engineers probably looked at that, and they looked at the rules of thumb and go, as long as I'm at 5% or less, I'm okay. It's a linear amplifier. It's in this price range. But then when we go to ultra linear, we want to get the harmonics to drop below 1% and the further down we can, which means the more we drop the harmonics down, the more complicated, more sophisticated the negative feedback circuit becomes. An example of the negative feedback circuit, not a dropping resistor, uh, you can go to two videos in my Premiere Twin 8. One shows how I solve the feedback or the hum and buzz by tapping the center by using a center tap of the 5 volt coil for the rectifier and feeding that back into the grid the RC circuit of a previous stage I also published the same schematic and show you how to do it in a push pull configuration that would be a very simple uh, circuit to employ to uh, minimize third order harmonic. Neither design taps the speaker output. That's very simplistic and somewhat okay. If you can get by with that first, great. If you can't, you have to step up your game and there's other circuits for that. So we're going to hold the harmonics down less than 1% on an ultra linear. Remember, this is vacuum tube age and generally if we keep it down below the thresholds that are generally rule of thumb, we're not going to have a problem. You're not going to hear it. Of course, there's people out there with the golden ears that they can hear better than most dogs. For those folks, you know, there's no hope. But the rest of us, we're good. Uh, the gain also on an ultra linear operation is going to be restricted. It's going to be limited. It's not going to go clear out to the zero grid line. I'm going to talk about that here in the next couple of slides. So it's going to be held to a lower um, amplitude, which means we're going to need more stages. We're going to need more preamp stages so we can gradually, so we can work in the sweet spot of the tube and not go out to the extremes so that we can step it up and keep the harmonics through each stage um, at a minimum. A linear amplifier tends to use less preamp stages. Now then, I saw this once and I thought, okay, I'm going to include it. The, the, uh, the person that posted this said that linear means that this part of the triode uh, curve is straight and therefore it is linear. No, 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 no. Not, not even close. Linear, as I already this, uh, discussed with you, is the difference uh, in the current change between bias and zero and bias and negative maximum negative grid voltage and if as long as the, that change above and below is the same no harmonics but if they're different we get a harmonic it has nothing to do with this these curves are parabolas yes they are parabolas there's nothing straight about any of this they're not just curvy here and get straight while they look straight they're not they're parabolas that's what they are how do I know that? I think I've already shown this before, but when you go above a uh, zero grid line, this grid uh, curve doesn't go uh, th this way. It flips over this way. It's the other half of the parabola. 
at plus 10 plus 20 volts that curve starts resembling the same it's the other half of the parabola now then because it's a vacuum tube things aren't perfect it's not a very good parabola but that is the basic shape it's the other half of the parabola but for linear and ultra linear amps in the stereo and guitar amp uh, community we're never going to operate above the zero grid line that would be a bad day we have a need at times to do this with this bad boy and there's other tubes that are much bigger than this and they actually need we need to understand the harmonic should we exceed the zero grid line and those tubes have those graphs published mostly so you know what's going to happen to you if you go over it not so much as to design there so it doesn't mean that line is straight it's a parabola different tubes now we have a pentode top left a beam pentode a triode and a transistor I'll touch on the transistor a little later we like a true triode we need a true triode because the grid spacing across from each of these curves are fairly uniform they're the same until we get way down here and then it it compresses but for a true triode the, the structure of the triode really makes these grid curves evenly spaced which means the, uh, uh, the change in voltage either side of the bias point for the signal being generated on the grid is going to be the same and it limits the second or harmonic which is why in the last video I showed you on the power harmonic curve the more you load up a triode the less the harmonics become they really drop off because of this now that a tetrode is nonlinear remember we have a load line running through here and here's our bias point we load line through there and either side of that bias point we have an imbalance in the current so what we want to do with um, a normal linear amplifier is we can utilize the full range from the zero grid down to the other uh, the maximum negative grid line and that would be a linear operation but if we want to go ultra linear we ha we need to limit the gain into that bias point because as we go up here this a change in current and the change in current down here are drastically different but if we keep it in the middle somewhere this change in current from the uh, positive going peak and the change in current from the negative going peak uh, actually diminish the harmonics quite significantly we can go from 5% harmonics which is shown by the red wave to something less than 1% maybe half percent if we limit the gain so the difference in operation between a linear and ultra linear would be this in radio work we would also want to pick the green wave too for the same reason we need to limit the uh, harmonics so the green line would be towards the ultra linear operation the red line just linear the tetrode or pentode is a triode the spacing here is not the same it looks like a triode but the change in uh, current uh, between 0 and minus 5 is radically different from then from minus 40 to minus 45 so as you can see in a linear operation this is the problem uh, big change in uh, current small change in current is asymmetrical right off the bat plus or minus 20 volts is asymmetrical in ultra linear operation we can still do this but what we want to do is we know as we approach the bias point either side of bias point the change in current while it's still different is not as pronounced therefore limiting the harmonic generation that would be the difference between using this uh, tetrode or pentode in triode operation uh, we want to operate as a cheap linear stereo and their application for that with the red uh, signal the green signal would be towards the ultra linear we're trying to limit the harmonics now then 
in a pentode, pentodes will not operate at all in linear anything for this reason. We have a problem down here. Remember, we have a load line going through the bias point, and as long as we're operating in this area, we're going to be somewhat okay. We can configure it for linear, ultra-linear operation. But remember, it, just because you put a load line on a graph and then build a tube amp doesn't mean you're done. We have to understand the full range of the load line uh, movement. And it does, for, for some frequencies, when we unload, it will drift down here into this area that I've identified with this red ellipse and the change in harmonics here's the change in current between these grid lines and here's the change in current between these two uh, grid lines notice there's a huge disparency in using a pentode uh, you're going to get a lot of harmonics which means in order to get a linear operation we're going to have to put in noise feedback something to, to limit the harmonics. We're generating them a lot, and now we've got to take care of it. There's a way around that. We can use a bin, uh, beam pentode, and that's even better because it's a constant current uh, device. Anytime I change a plate voltage on, you know, on a regular pentode, I have a huge change in current. So from here to here, I've got a, a radical change in current. On a beam pentode, or beam tetrode, if I have a huge change in plate voltage, the current doesn't char change hardly any at all. That is good for us. Because if this is our load line for the average uh, starting point, and then we unload it and we go down into here, into this range, we are looking at possibly generating more harmonics when we unload as I've shown in the last video, but here's the difference. Here's a change, here's the a change in, in current between this grid line and this one where the, the grid lines are intersecting the load line, but here's the next change. They're nearly the same, so the harmonics won't generate. They'll be very minimal because the change in current from the A wave to the B wave is going to be smaller and it just goes on down. So it's a constant current device. We like being pentodes because it's a constant current device and that actually helps harmonics. So for a linear amplifier, you're gonna probably have a pentode. But for an ultra linear, you're going to move to a beam pentode. That makes it better. A beam pentode. <laughs> That's why people use this in radio work because this is a constant current device at 400 watts or 3000 volts in the DC plate. So what does it look like? Distortion. Remember back in my earlier video I said here's my what we want. It's wishful thinking. You put a volt in and a volt and several volts come out. There's no warping there's nothing going on there. There's no harmonics. Okay? On a tetrode and pento, they operate along this red line. It's curvy. So at low voltage, you're not going to hear much difference, but the higher the voltage it gets, the higher the amplification factor and Miller capacitance adding into everything as well. We get this. We get this curvy line. A triode, even though it doesn't give you as much power. It is this line up here. It's closer to the wish list or the wish line, but it's it's operating here at less power. The tetrode or pentode in triode operation is operating somewhere between a uh, tetrode and you know this red line and this other triode line. It's somewhere in between. And depending on how we configure it, how we strap it, how we deal with our um, noise feedback circuit, we're going to be uh, much better than this red curvy line for our straight pentode, but we can go into a beam pentode will get me here as well. And then if I take a beam pentode and, st and strap it for triode operation, I start approaching the triode line with more power. And that's great. Now we have a nice stereo amp with power, more ultra-linear operation than just a 
uh, triode. So, transistors are linear, right? I mean, think of it. The calculations never require grid curves. Well, I think it's because most people don't go out there and look for them. They're there. They're published. The, a lot of people go, well, here's how you calculate the gain. Here's how you calculate the harmonics. Here's how you calculate, calculate, calculate. And what they don't do is go back to this. Remember this? This on the left is the average plate characteristics for a pentode or tetrad because there's a kink down here. Okay? Here is a graph for a transistor. Notice the curvy lines here. A change in the drain source voltage, a large change in drain source voltage, gives me a large change in the drain current. And when I get a large change in the drain current, I put a load line through here and put my bias point here, I'm going to get harmonics. Just the same way I got them over here. You can pick a transistor that looks like a constant current device, in which case you can limit the harmonics. So if you're using transistors for a linear amplifier, you're probably looking at something like this. If you're using transistors for ultra-linear operation, you're probably going to pick a constant current transistor, much like a beam pentode equivalent. That's the difference. So, that wraps up this. I just wanted to cover this because I really like to stay stay with the facts, the figures, and the data. I like staying away from the marketing ploys, you know, linear, ultra linear. They those are good terms, but they have limited value. But this is what it means when those terms are are used. This, these are the characteristics you should uh, see in a schematic when you pick it up. You start looking for those things. Are if they're present on the schematic then it's probably, uh, you know, if some of them are present, it's a linear schematic, and if it's more are present, and especially the negative feedback is a little bit more sophisticated, you realize uh, it's probably an ultra-linear amplifier, despite whatever they may call it. That's what's going to happen. You, uh, if they say it's an ultra-linear amplifier and they're used to using the pentode, I would cast this, you know, uh, quizzical eye and go, well, wait a minute here. Why aren't you using a beam pinto? It'd be so easy to do that. In the next video, I'm now going to start the math. I'm going to set the foundation for the grid voltage signal. I need you to understand what that is and why it looks like it does, because in the video after that, the math starts. Those videos will be longer. Just put it out there for you. Thank you for watching.